Uh, my name is Brandon Pankey, um, and welcome to another edition of Live Nation Urban Presents Meet, um, excuse me, the souls of black folk. We are waiting um, for Miss Kemba Smith to join back on. She should be joining momentarily. Um, we are going to be talking about criminal justice reform today, and there is Kemba now. There she is. Yes. <laughs> How are you? I'm good, and you? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. We're glad to have you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Before I before I go into it, I, I was going into some statistics on um, incarceration in this country and just criminal justice and how we really do need reform. So before we get into your story, I just want to walk through just a couple of key statistics. As I stated before, the United States incarcerates its citizens more than any other country in this world. Those mass incarcerations disproportionately affect African Americans, other people of color, and also low income citizens in this country. Let's go through. The U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but nearly 25% of its incarcerated population. From 1980 to 2017, the number of women in jails and prisons in the U.S. grew 750%, and over 225,000 women are incarcerated today. This is unacceptable. This is why there needs to be reform in our criminal justice system, and this is why I am beyond elated to have uh, Ms. Kemba Smith Pradia here, an author, a public speaker, a criminal justice reform consultant, and she is the founder of the Kemba Smith Foundation. Kemba, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Really appreciate the invite. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's, I mean, I want to go right into it because you have yeah. so many story, and I don't even want to give any of it. You can just go into your background and just talk about being incarcerated and where you are today. Well, it's interesting you read the statistics and, um, you know, I was fortunate in the fact that, um, you know, back in the 90s, um, I was sentenced to 24 and a half years as a first time nonviolent drug offender. And um, after, and when I say fortunate, I was fortunate in the fact that there was um, a tremendous amount of support around my case and my story. Because after I was sentenced to 24 and a half years as a first time nonviolent drug offender, even though the prosecutor said I never handled, used, or sold any of the drugs that were involved, um, I ended up getting sentenced to longer than I had actually been living on this earth. And I also had turned myself in um, seven months pregnant. So I gave birth to my first child. And so hearing those um, statistics, you know, it's still troubling to me today, even almost being out 20 years, mm -hmm. um, December, it'll be 20 years. But for me, once I went inside the system and saw the reality of what was going on, um, I was behind a prison wall where I felt like my life didn't matter, you mm -hmm. know, and so in coming out, um, it was a, a, a national movement. Um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund ended up taking on my case pro bono after um, the media and the first media outlet was Emerge Magazine and the publisher was George Curry, where he highlighted my story, where my graduate high school graduation picture was on the front page of this magazine. And so the black community was outraged and was able to get the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to take on my case. But it wasn't because you know, they felt sorry for poor little me and, you know, right. my parents' only child. You know, I went to college at Hampton University, got caught up with a drug dealer, which led to this relationship that led to um, this prison sentence. But it was because the fastest growing population at the time were Black women. And so Elaine Jones, who was president of, director of the organization at the time, she was from Virginia, law school graduate from UVA, and she said she was going to do whatever she needed to do to bring her home girl home. And right. so that's what she committed to. And it was a long process. But back then in the 90s, somebody getting sentenced to 24 and a half years, there was a lot of brothers and sisters getting sentenced to life sentences. They were handing out life sentences like it was candy wow. um, for drug offenses because I did have a crack cocaine offense. And so it was a modern day miracle for me to even, you know, get my sentence commuted by the president of the United States. And so um, there's a lot that I want to share. But in hearing those statistics, the reason why I'm still committed to this movement is because I couldn't walk away from what I had seen, what my spirit, my soul had felt with seeing so many people of color in the federal prison system 
that to me deserves a second chance. And I'm grateful for my second chance. And so after being out, it was important for me to be a part of this movement. And that's what I've been committed to um, since my release. And when I walked out of federal prison, um, it was announced that I had gotten my sentence commuted by President Clinton. The prison officials hadn't even told me yet. And when I, the first person that told me was my friend, Michelle West. Um, and she still, I was released in 2000. She mm -hmm. started her prison sentence in 93. And she is still sitting in federal prison serving a double life sentence plus 50 years. And so to know that I have sisters like that that are still in yeah. prison, it's important for me to continue to be that human face to help continue the movement. So that's why I've been so passionate with continuing to share the story. And, and, and you've been featured on TV once for my man in 2019 and BET Bing. Talk about Just Leadership USA and, and the Justice Roundtable, you know, why that's so important in, in some of the work that you're doing right now. Well, in, in coming out and putting together the pieces um, of my life, um, one of the things that isn't addressed is like the trauma, because what led to my incarceration was because I was in an unhealthy relationship and I made certain choices and decisions. It was an abusive relationship. Okay. And so there was trauma with that. But then when I went into the prison system, there was also trauma. And so coming out, I was grateful to have the support. Like, you know, I had an attorney offer me a job. I went back to college, but there was still this brokenness um, that I really couldn't share with, you know, I did try to share, but I couldn't really connect with people and, figuring out who Kimball was today and building myself up. And so um, it was um, in 2019 where I applied to be a part of Just Leadership USA. And basically it's a community of formerly incarcerated individuals. And I encourage anyone to please take a look because if you go on their website, which is um, J, JUSA.org, yeah. And I feel like that is not right, but hold on. It's jlusa.org. Yeah. And if you click on leadership, connect with our leaders, you will see an array of formerly incarcerated people that are leading criminal justice reform work across the country. So, you know, we're in a different climate. When I came out in 2000, criminal justice was not the big thing to talk about, right. but it was important for me to get in the mix with other criminal justice leaders across the country. Mm -hmm. And basically our objective is de to try to end mass incarceration and in having these leadership trainings, which people can find more information about is to build us up so that we can be a part of the solutions and have seats at the table where we can actually make a change. Cause oftentimes when people are talking about policy reform or reentry, they don't even think to include a person that's been incarcerated. So they need to go to the source to understand what needs to be fixed. And so it's just important for that community to be involved and to have a seat at the table to make a difference. So just leadership is a community that I've been able to really communicate with. And mm -hmm. there's another um, organization, uh, the justice round table yeah. where um, people can go on to their site site, which is justiceroundtable.org. And basically some of the organizations and partners that they have, fortunately, after I came out of prison, I was able to connect with some of those same organizations and continue to do the work. And so they have quarterly meetings where people can get information in different working groups. So I just strongly encourage people to go onto their sites, get information, especially if you have a loved one that's incarcerated um, with this COVID pandemic, they have information on their websites that can tell you certain things that you can do to be involved, things that are happening like now. Yes. So you want to make sure you log in. And, and you have voting rights, correct? I do have my um, voting rights, and but it was something that, um, you know, when you talk about Black Lives Matter and how hard our ancestors fought um, in order for us to, to have this basic fundamental human right. When I was released from prison after serving six and a half years, um, I was not able to vote. And 
in the state of Virginia, Virginia used to be one of the four states that permanently disenfranchises individuals unless they apply to get their rights restored. And so I actually had to like go through, like if I was trying to get a mortgage or get into an Ivy League university and submitting certain documents um, and, and get certain um, letters um, to kind of back the fact that I was rehabilitated and, and reformed in order to get my rights restored. And I really had kind of blocked it out as far as in 20, um, when President Obama's um, first election was in 2008, correct? Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, I'm getting older and my time gets off, but I wasn't able to vote. And mm. so for me, I was mad. It, it was just an array of emotions as, and, and, and also just feeling sad because I felt like, why am I sitting here feeling like I'm less than human mm. and I can't go actively participate in something that should be a basic human fundamental right? Mm. And so I did get my rights restored in 2012. I had the opportunity to work with the NAACP National um, with a uh, felony disenfranchisement um, uh, initiative that they had. And basically we traveled to Geneva, Switzerland um, okay. to speak before the United Nations um, about voter suppression laws in the U.S. And so, you know, for me, I take voting very seriously and we have a dilemma in our nation right now. And so one of the things that I hope that everyone recognizes, and I you know, heard Stephanie in a previous episode that you had, um, the importance of us taking, making sure that we take every initiative to make sure that we have numbers at the polls and understand just how important um, that is. But in also talking about voting rights, um, please make sure you complete that census. Because one of the things too, when I was in federal prison, I didn't understand being locked down in Danbury, Connecticut and having to fill out this census form. But what I did understand later hindsight and doing the work that I'm doing is that they wanted to count me in that small, you know, rural city where funding will go for those people that are incarcerated in these rural cities when they need to be going into where people are from. And so, I hope that everyone will take the time out to fill out that census and make sure that you go out to vote as well. And, and I wanted to speak about voting rights only because I think some individuals, when they come out of prison, they, they may not know that they have the right to vote again. There are only four states, I believe, that you know, you're permanently banned from voting. So I just think that's super critical you know, as we enter into a, a very, very important election um, coming in November. So that's why I wanted to ask that. Yeah. Uh, so, Talk to me about the Kimba Smith Foundation and, and the work you're doing there. Well, my foundation was um, incorporated when I was incarcerated. And uh, the, the people that I need to make sure I mention today are my parents. Um, mm -hmm. Throughout my whole journey, my parents have been my heroes. And so they would come and visit me in prison and they would see the other women and they would be distraught and they wanted to fight to help to bring me home. And so we created this foundation and they started doing um, college tours across the country. And um, that's where the foundation basically got started. And since then I've partnered with various different organizations and it focused more on um, mentoring. Um, there's an organization called National um, Alliance of Faith and Justice. Yeah. And basically, it's a curriculum called What's Love Got to Do With It that's centered around um, my story and my book. And so we've been able to um, initiate this program all across the country. But my, my take is, is that not only do I want policy reform, but mm -hmm. I've also been committed to share my story because I don't feel as if each and every young person have to, has to make each and every mistake there is to make in life, that they can hear another person's story and make a determination that they don't want to go down that same path. So it's been important through my foundation to educate um, young people about, you know, the traps that you can get caught up in, um, in particular women and toxic relationships. Um, but also, too, um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure I mentioned as well, you know, with regard to women and girls 
incarceration and reentry. I mean, one of the things that I think was unfortunate with my situation, and I mentioned it earlier, is that no one in my at my sentencing took into consideration of the fact that I was in an abusive relationship and the trauma that women and girls experience. And so there is a different dynamic to women and being incarcerated. And my crime wasn't that I was criminally minded. It was the fact that I got into the a wrong relationship. So as far as rehabilitation and programming, the programs that women have in prison are very limited. And so in coming out and re-entry, I feel that there needs to be more programming and assistance for women, in particular also Black women, um, yeah. coming out of prison and make sure that there's gender responsive um, programming to the needs of, of that of our population. And so, you know, I have friends, um, Andrea James, um, she does a lot with women and incarceration, but also um, Susan Burton, um, Topeka Sam, they, they have actually re-entry programs um, where they have taken the lead to provide housing um, and all different type of programs that can be beneficial to people coming home. And so with my foundation, I'm in the process, actually, I'm being transparent here and mm -hmm. in, um, in, in, building, in building my board um, and also having more centered um, programming and looking out for funding opportunities for my foundation as well. Yeah. And so also, too, um, <laughs> this is, you know, my book Poster Child and, you know, never in a million years would I have thought that I would be so transparent about my story, but if anyone has a, a young person um, that they're, you know, struggling with or a college student that you want to prepare for, you know, certain things, it's a cautionary tale um, and true to life. Um, so I strongly encourage that if you're interested in getting the book and hear more about um, what actually occurred with my story and incarceration and how I got caught up, please feel free to read it. Kimba, I wanted to bring up the book. You took the Okay. Story. No, no, no. That's all you. Um, but since you've mentioned the book, can you talk about the movie deal that you have with BET? Yes. Um, um, I'm, it's been a long time, a long time coming. I mean, I have dealt with um, different movie producers. Um, you know, initially when I came home, um, John Singleton was interested in my story and um, I've worked with other um, producers, but MPI, um, and they're working with BET, um, where we're in the process of, you know, moving things forward. So I'm really, really excited about that and where God, um, where God takes it. But, I, you know, I've been on the public speaking circuit for, you know, just as long as I've been home and even beforehand, because I can remember, you know, a friend from New York bringing kids into the prison for me to talk to while I was incarcerated, but it's been a long time coming and um, I want the story to tell itself. I want it to go out to the masses and I want people. And it's, it's interesting that you have this superhero um, shirt on. Um, but I really think, you know, so many people will read a story like mine and be like, wow, you know, you're so strong. How did you overcome? And, I don't think individuals realize just how resilient you can be as a person, in particular us Black people and what our people have endured back in the day. And that history and knowledge is what kept me strong through my ordeal and helped me minimize my own individual situation to look at the bigger picture and honestly help me understand my responsibility and what it is that I'm doing today. Absolutely. You know, in thinking about recent events, there was a young girl, and I mentioned it um, when we tried to do the live a couple minutes prior. Young girl named Grace, they haven't given her full name, lived in suburban Detroit, and she was sent to juvenile detention because she didn't complete her online homework properly. All that. And, and, you know, she may have had some issues with her mother. But when I think about this 15 year old Black girl who's being sent to juvenile detention for something that I, I've done that everybody in the world has done, which is not do their homework, you know, correctly at some point. What can we do, you know, to avoid these types of stories? What kind of actions can we take 
when we're talking about criminal reform and, and wanting to volunteer, wanting to be a part of organizations. I know you talked about Just Leadership USA and the Justice Roundtable. Is there anything else you could recommend um, that, that people can do, that I can do, that anyone? Just the importance. I mean, what you're doing right now is great, but in this COVID area arena, we have to do things differently. And so before COVID, there were criminal justice um, roundtables or town halls or in different countries. But going back to voting, I mean, we need to make sure that we have forums where we invite these people that are the gatekeepers to the criminal justice system and have them on, you know, under a light interrogation to find out what is their mentality yep. with how severe or not severe that they think that they should be with regard to certain policies and picking their brains and making sure that we don't have, you know, people that don't have our best interests at heart, you know, and, you know, I know there's so many people out there that are just like, you know, and I don't, I don't really want to go, you know, too political, but voting is so important, you know, like, I don't understand, you may feel like, you know, it doesn't affect you or, you know, it's, we're voting for two old white guys, but you need to understand that these are the people that create and policies that are going to impact you as in one shape form, one form, shape or another, right. they will. So we need to make sure that we highlight these individuals and know what their mentalities are and push the envelope and making sure that they understand this is what we want. And in order for you to hold the elected office, you need to make sure that you're representing our best interests. Absolutely. Well, Kimba, on, on that note, I'm going to take something you said a couple of minutes ago. Yes, I'm wearing a superhero shirt, but you are absolutely the hero. I can't wait to, to actually read your book because we're ordering it a few of us at Live Nation Urban. Just so you know, Live Nation Urban is a supporter of what you do and who you are and whatever you need from us. We are a resource for you. So thank you so much. And and last but not least, I just want to give God the glory. All the time. The fact that, and I'm, you know, I'm not here in this capacity, but anybody that's listening, understand that sometimes you go through things. And 94, when I went in the system, I didn't know what was going on. I felt like my world was crashing, but I've just, and I'm not trying to turn this into church, but I have trusted God through this journey. Some of the time, a very painful journey, but never in a million years would I have thought that he would put me in a position because not only am I a public speaker consultant and, you know, doing all these things, but God has put me in a position to wear a new hat which is actually Governor Northam appointed me to the Virginia Parole Board towards the end of 2019. So I actually have a vote on whether or not a person will be released from prison um, earlier than what it's intended for them. So um, that's something that I don't take lightly. So I just share that as a, as a token of inspiration to others. And God is no respecter of persons. What he's done for me, he can do for you as well. So just please hold on. And thank you again, Brandon, for this opportunity. Nah, thank you. Thank you. A friend of mine who's in education, um, she quoted and said, you know, my life is nothing but a series of miracles. And when I hear stories of, you know, like yours and others, and even my day to day, it's nothing but miracles every day. And so I'm thankful um, that you found time for us today and, and really appreciative, appreciative, excuse me, to have you here. You're welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Absolutely. This has been another episode of The Souls of Black Folk. My name has been Brandon Panky, and we'll be back next week. And we're going to be talking about mental health next week. Thank you again to Kemba Smith. Buy her book. Look out for her on BET. Phenomenal woman, phenomenal story. And it's just going to keep getting better. So thank you, Kemba, for being here. You're welcome. Take care, Brandon. Be safe out there. Likewise. Take care. You too.